So basically, um, today's lecture um, is going to be similar to Janine's. So hopefully, you know, you'll really understand linear regression by the end of today. Um, and I'm going to try and skip parts that you've already heard so that we go a bit faster. But at the same time, I want you to stop me and ask because um, today's lecture is going to be important for future lectures. So if you don't understand today, then it's going to be more difficult to understand later lectures. At the same time, today I'm going to go through uh, some math, so in more detail, because linear regression is a simple model, so we can see exactly how it works. But not all of you need to understand the full details of that, so I'll tell you which, you, which parts you really need to remember and which parts are maybe a bit more, um, you know, for interest for some people and then more important for some other people, yeah? Uh, but also, if you don't have a question but you feel you're starting to get lost, then just raise your hand and I'll give you a moment to just think about it, you know? It's new concept, so there is no, um, you know, you can take a minute to actually understand the concept, that's fine. You can ask me for that. So, I guess you've seen a very similar picture from Janine, <laughs> right? We have these little dots, are data points. And uh, now I'm going to introduce some notation. So we're going to, my notation is similar to Janine's, so I'm using y for um, our dependent variable and x for the input, so the covariates. Um, I'm going to call them inputs, another word for that. And um, what happens here is that we have basically paired observation. So for each individual, we have both the dependent variable and the covariate, right? And I here denotes individuals, right? So x1, y1 is going to be the um, covariate and the output for individual one x2, y2 for individual 2, x3, y3 for individual 3, and so on, right? And we're going to have n individuals. Okay, so for instance, we can have, remember my example from the first day, we can have yi, we want to predict the height of person i by looking at the average height of his or her parents. Okay, so if we if we saw this picture, what could be a good description for the relationship between X and Y? Right? What is the kind of pattern, the kind of trend that we observe in this data? Can we say something about the value of Y if we know the value of X? So if we have the average parents, that we have a couple and we know their average height, can we make a prediction of the height of, of their children if they had, if they had any? Yeah. So here, well, probably from Janine's talk as well, this is even more linear, um, so we can fit a line, right? Um, and a line is described this way, so Janine used A and B, I'm using alpha and beta, but same thing. Um, so basically we have alpha being the intercept term and beta being the um, uh, slope of the line, and now we want to know for instance, which of these three lines is the best, right? So all of these have slightly different intercept um, and um, slightly different slope, but they could all, you know, they all look reasonable fits in the data, but which one do we want to use to make future predictions, right? What is our model? That's what we're trying to, to find out. Um, and now what we're going to do is can we use these n data points that we have to actually learn the alpha and beta, okay? And learn means estimate. So we use a different vocabulary perhaps in machine learning, but the concepts are exactly the same. So, um, yeah. Okay, and we're going to start learning by minimizing the model residuals. So this is exactly what we had in the previous lecture, right? So yi is the true phenotype. We know that, and alpha plus beta xi is our model. So I have it in blue here and green. I don't know if you can see the colors there in the projector. 
And what happens is we take the line that basically minimizes these differences from the line. So we want our points to be as close to the line as possible on average. That's, that's the um, intuition behind least squares. And uh, why we take a square term? Well, we could have the absolute in principle, but because um, we need to take derivatives of that to actually find the optimal solution, then square terms are nicer, <laughs> in the same way that exponential functions are nicer mathematical objects when you take derivatives. So that's, that's why uh, this happens, right? Taking the derivative of an absolute value is more difficult. So, now, okay, so basically, you've heard of the, all of this in the previous talk, right? But now we're going to see how we can derive a very, very similar algorithm, a very, very similar way. Okay, let's actually go through this uh, equation in a bit more detail. So what does this say? This part may be confusing. It says that we have some arguments, so arg, and we want to minimize this function with respect to these arguments, right? So we want to find the alpha and beta value that minimize this function, okay? And this is a sum over all the individuals. With me so far? Okay. So now we're gonna see how we can get to a very similar optimization problem by using likelihoods, okay? So what we say now is that, okay, the underlying relationship in our data points is linear. But we also know that when we observe the data point, there's going to be some noise. So there's going to be something that is not directly uh, explainable by the underlying linear relationship. And we are going to make the assumption that this noise is Gaussian, okay? So this noise comes from a Gaussian distribution. Why we do this? Well, uh, a lot of mathematical properties, which I won't go into details, but uh, basically, um, I'm not sure how to summarize this in an easy way. <laughs> uh, so, um, I guess it gives us nice properties, and if we assume that the noise is random, then it's a, it's a reasonable assumption, I suppose, to think that it comes from a Gaussian distribution. So, now we have our response. We know this, this is the true phenotype, the true height of the person. We have our model for the person and we have some noise. Right. So let's stop now and I'll tell you a nice uh, uh, story about uh, Gaussian distributions. Of course, Janine has, been, has gone through this a lot, but actually this formula here, so if we, if we have a variable z, that is distributed according to a normal distribution. This is the formula that gives us the density, um, the density function of the Gaussian distribution. And actually, I don't know if you can see this here, this is the 10 uh, German marks before the euro was uh, um, used. And I don't know if you can see this, but here is actually a Gaussian distribution, this bell curve, and we also have this formula behind. So there is a joke that, you know, uh, German students would not learn this actually because, you know, they could just take some money out of their pockets and, and copy it in exams. So, there. So, a Gaussian distribution looks like this. I think Janine has gone through the Gaussian distribution to some extent, so probably you don't need me to, to go through many details. But basically, we have a mean value. Here, the mean is, I denote the mean by mu, and in this case, the mean is zero. So, this point here is zero, and um, here the variance is one and the standard deviation, but the sigma square. Good, so now, can you think of any examples when the Gaussian distribution is a poor model choice, right? So, for some types of data, yes, we can make the Gaussian assumption, right? But what happens with the Gaussian, actually, I'm not sure how uh, much Janine went into this, is that if you, you have the mean, right, and you have one standard deviation each side of the mean, we have 68% of our observations are in there. And two standard deviations from the mean, 95, 95 
almost 0.5% of our observations are in there. So what does that mean, right? It means that the data points we observe are kind of close together, right? So we don't have, imagine you're trying to do, uh, to model stock market, okay? And there we have the prices might be steady, 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 and then you have a drop in the market for whatever reason. You know, someone announces that the CEO of X company is going to retire or something like this, and suddenly you have a, a sudden drop, you know, just going. So you have something like, let's draw something here. So you have, um, this is time, and this is the price of a stock. And you have something like this, you know, as time goes, the stock price goes a little bit up maybe, and so on, and then we have a crash, right? And we have a data point here, okay? So this one is actually, to model this kind of price, the distribution of price, a Gaussian distribution would be a bad choice. Because basically what we have is we have a lot of observations that are far, far away from the mean, right? And for that, we need what we call distributions with more heavy tails. So they allow for more of the probability mass being in this area here. Yeah? Just to give you a, some more, inf the Gaussian is used extensively, you know, so it's good to understand a little bit about it. Right, so let's go back to linear regression now. All good so far, and we said that um, our noise is Gaussian, okay? So now I'm going to make this statement, and then we're going to see how we get to this statement, okay? So I'm telling you that the probability distribution of y given the input xi and the two parameters of our model alpha and beta is also going to be a Gaussian distribution, okay? And it's going to be a Gaussian distribution with this mean. The mean is given by our linear model and the variance of that, distri of that Gaussian distribution is given by our noise. Okay, so now the question is, I think Janine talked about this as well, but to some extent, I think it's good to understand why this happens, right? Is it clear for everyone how we get from here to there? It wasn't clear for me for a long time, okay? Until I do the, did the math on the next slide, which are gonna go through together. So we know from theory, from mathematics, that actually linear transformation of Gaussian variables are Gaussian variables, okay? So here we have um, basically xi is given, so it's not a variable, we know the value. Alpha and beta are given, we know their values. And the only thing that is a variable is epsilon i, our noise, right? So basically this only has a single random variable plus something, which we know. It's given, right? We're given xi, alpha, and beta. So we know then from mathematics that this yi is going to be distributed according to a Gaussian distribution. But what is the mean and the variance of this Gaussian? Right? I tell you here that's what it is, and you can take my word for it, but maybe we can do something more, and we can show you how you can actually derive this. Okay? So... Um, actually, before I went there, I gave you one answer that I was planning to ask a question for, which is, once we know that this is a Gaussian distribution, then we know what, what we need to find out is the mean and the variance, because these two parameters describe a Gaussian distribution, okay? So this is what we need to find out for this particular variable. So our model, we have this as before, and the noise, this is same as previous slide. And now we're gonna try and find the mean, and then we're gonna try and find the variance, okay? So this actually, if you don't follow the complete derivation, it doesn't matter that much. But uh, if you can, then that's great. So basically what we say is the mean, you, you talked about this yesterday, is the expected value of y. So if we observe a lot of y's, what will be the average? in that sample. So we have the expected value of y, and we just replace here y with the 
um, uh, with this formula basically, right? So here I just replaced y with its definition. Now we know some properties of expectation. So basically, if we have sums, we can break this down into single expectations, okay? So we have expectation of alpha, expectation of beta he, x, sorry, that's Greek, <laughs> and expectation of epsilon, okay? And we know some more things, actually. We know that the mean of epsilon is zero, right? This is how we defined our model. So this term we can drop out. And we also know that the expectation of constant values is constant, is that constant, right? Alpha is not, uh, is not a variable. We know its value, it's alpha, okay? So there is no expectation there. So basically, what we get here is that the mean is alpha plus beta he, beta x. Sorry, if, it's, if it all sounds Greek, probably is, so stop me. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so yeah, good with this one? So from before, right, this is the mean, we derived it, we know that, that this is going to be the mean of our, um, of our variable y. Now let's go to the, to the variance, okay? Then we know that the variance of, uh, of y is y minus the expectation of y squared. Okay, good. Let's apply some things now. Let's first apply the square term to this parenthesis. Okay, that's simple. Let's say high school math, uh, you know, we have y squared, oh, wait a second, y squared min minus 2y expectation y plus expectation y squared, right? Okay, now, yep. let's see what happens. Let's apply the expectation to every single term from this summation, okay? Then when we do this, we basically end up with this. This was a constant term, so it stays the same. We have the expectation of epsilon squared. And then we have um, this term, which basically because the expectation of epsilon is zero, then all of this goes to zero. And then we have this, these terms here, and we'll see what's gonna happen with them there. Basically, these things cancel out, and this thing here we know, the variance of, it's basically the variance of <coughs> epsilon, right? So we have sigma squared. So there we go. And that's the variance of y, of, sorry, of y given x, alpha, and beta, right? So it's a conditional distribution. It's the distribution of y given the values of x, alpha, and beta, okay? Because we can treat those as parameters as well, and then things change. So as homework, you can do the following. You can try and derive the marginal distribution of y given alpha and beta. So what happens here is that basically um, now we, we need to take into account what happens with x, right? And what, what happens with, um, uh, with marginal distributions, then if uh, the variable, so we want this, right? And this can be written as p of y x given alpha beta, but then we need to sum over x, okay? Because we need to take into account all what happens in x. You saw this yesterday with Janine in an example with the table when you were summing rows and columns, right? And um, if x is continuous, then we need to take the, the integral of this with respect to x, but we're not gonna go into this because we can use some tricks and some known things. So if we assume that x is normally distributed, then we have the sum of two Gaussian variables or linear transformations of two Gaussian variables here. We have x being a Gaussian variable, we have epsilon being a Gaussian variable. So we know again from mathematics that this is gonna be a Gaussian variable, right? So what can we do then? without having to take this integral, which is kind of... Okay. Well, same as before, 
right? We start from scratch and we write the expectations, although now we need to take care because x is no longer constant, right? It's no longer a constant term, it's not given, so we need to treat it as a variable in the same way that we were treating, treating epsilon. Okay. So if you derive this, uh, come and find me. So, okay, so now at least we know that y is distributed according to this Gaussian distribution, right? With mean alpha plus beta x and variance sigma epsilon squared. And what we can do now is we can write the likelihood of each data point, okay? So the likelihood of observing that particular height that we observed of individual i, given our model parameters and the input, is going to be given by this Gaussian uh, probability density function. Right? So then, this is exactly the formula that we were looking before when I showed you the 10 mark note. Yeah, this is exactly it, just applying. Um, here we have the mean of y and we have the variance of y. Okay. And that's great because then we can actually write the likelihood of all our data points, okay? So we basically assume that, um, that, sorry, the data points are independently and identically distributed. And this is a very important point here because if we know that, then if we take this probability distribution, which is P of y1, y2, y3, blah, 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 yn, given x1, 2, okay, alpha and beta, then we know if these data points are actually iid, then we know that this is equal to the product over i of p, yi, given xi, alpha, beta, Okay, so it's the first one, the second one, the third one, and so on. And that's, that's usually, um, well, in most models, that, that's the assumption that we make. Okay, we can treat non-IID observations, but in most models, at least as a starting point, we make this assumption. Okay, and we can write this product, and this formula, I have it in blue because you should remember it. It's an important, uh, you know, it, it applies in everything. So what happens here is this weird symbol is the likelihood of theta. Theta now is going to be a vector having our parameters because in this case our parameters are alpha and beta, but for other models we might have a completely different set of parameters. So it's easy to just use theta to represent any model parameters, okay? Um, and so here we have the probability uh, of observing the data points, the data set that we have given this set of parameters, and we have this factorization. Okay, and that's the likelihood. That's it. So I'm gonna maybe, okay. So now because we know that this is a Gaussian distribution, we can also apply this, and then we get this formula. Right, so we have the product over all the i's. And um, what happens here is because we basically now want to optimize this function, we will want to optimize this function, and actually doing products of things is computationally expensive. So what we can do is we can take the logarithm of that function, and then we get the log likelihood. And the log likelihood is usually the kind of uh, beast we work with. Okay. Uh, and that's because next we're going to take derivatives of that. So we're going to see that in a minute. But before I get there, I wanted to know how many of you know about vectors, what a vector is and what a matrix is. Or let's say how many of you don't know. Do you want a... Okay. Good. Um, right. A random sample. Um, so, in, in short, a vector is basically a, a mathematical object that has one or more values in it. So, if we write x, and I use this uh, kind of bold notation for, so this is bold, 
this is uh, darker, let's say. So if we have um, in, in the whiteboard, it's easy to put this sign for vectors. And basically, this is something like this. So it will have x1, x2, up to xp. Okay, so it has several values in it, and we can do different things with it. And I'm going to talk about um, what kinds of things we can do next. But then if we have lots of these, then we can have a matrix, basically. And that's the, the other object that we're going to use. Have I lost anyone? Good. Perfect. So now what we're going to do is we want to take the solution that maximizes the likelihood of the data, right? So we're going to say, OK, we have this model that generated our data points. And now we want to find the parameters that maximize the likelihood of observing this data, right? So what fits our data best? Which model gives the maximum likelihood? Good. So the logarithm, that's why we take it, is actually a monotonic function. So what happened to our original function, if, it, if its optimum is over there, the logarithm will also have its uh, optimum over there. So that's why we can use the log likelihood, and this is easier to use. And now what we need to do is basically we need to take the derivatives of this thing with respect to alpha and the derivatives of this thing with respect to beta and then set those derivatives to zero and then solve for alpha and beta respectively and then we get the maximum likelihood solutions. Okay, and I'm not going to go through this math explicitly but if you want to, to see it, just come and find me. It's just not of uh, general interest, I think. So... Basically, once we do, uh, actually, okay, this is still um, taking the, the derivatives, so I haven't really set this to, to zero. But what we can do here is, if you see this term, this term doesn't depend on alpha or on beta. So we can basically drop it, okay, because the derivatives of alpha and beta will not depend on that, will not have this in, the, in their expression. So what we have here is we want to maximize the log likelihood with respect to theta, our parameters, so alpha and beta. Uh, and this is just writing out basically theta. And if we just drop this term, then we end up with the sum over the data points of this expression. And then we can drop this minus sign and get the minimum of that. So from max to minimum and drop the, the minus sign. Do you see this? Yeah, OK. <laughs> And then we can take this part out because it's a constant with respect to alpha and beta. And what does this look like? This expression here. Does it remind you of something? What? Perfect. The least squares solution, right? We're minimizing our residuals, our error terms. So from, we can formulate this problem as, a, as the least squares objective and maximize that, uh, sorry, minimize that, or we can try and maximize the, ma the, the likelihood of the data, and we end up, in this case, with this assumption that we made, uh, we end up with the same solution, right? Provided that the, this uh, sigma, the variance of the noise, is, uh, is some constant, which it is in the least squares as well. Good. And now, just for your uh, interest, I thought I'll give you the, the actual formulas that uh, alpha and beta take. I don't think, I don't know this. I would have to derive them, so, you know, you don't need to know this. But it's, uh, yeah, if you wanted to take the derivatives and do all the process, it's good to check your solution that it matches that. Some people learn this way. And we could also assume that this um, sigma, so the variance of the noise, we could assume that this is also a variable. Um, so, sorry, this is also a parameter of our model, and we could also optimize with respect to that. Okay. So, what we tend to do in real life is we standardize our output variable. So, we, we take the, the z score. I don't know if uh, if that's a bit uh, complicated, but basically, we we 
subtract the mean and divide by the variance of our output just to get the Z scores and then that output has zero mean and one variance. But in principle, we don't have to do this. We could just learn the variance uh, from our data, right? But in this case, we would, we would need to learn three parameters. So we need more data points and so on. Good. Okay, that's all good, but now let's go to more dimensions because what we're talking about here is million dimensional data sets or 3,000 dimensional data sets and that's the important thing. And one thing to remember is that the intuitions we have on, on low dimensions don't necessarily generalize in high dimensions. So sometimes we need to think what happens. So imagine now we have two dimensions. Okay, from one we go to two, then we go to thousands. <laughs> so we have y here, we have x1, sorry, x1 and x2, and we have data points in this space. And now what we want to do is we want to now fit what is called in mathematics a hyperplane. Okay, so it's not a line, it's a one-dimensional plane, but now we want to fit a, a two-dimensional plane, um, sorry, yep, a two-dimensional plane uh, and so on. So, you saw this before in Janine's lecture, this was called uh, um, multiple regression, what did you, yeah? Okay. <laughs> Um, so now we have our intercept term and we have x1 and we have x2 and because I'm going to introduce some vectors, I'm going to switch from alpha and beta, I'm going to switch to w0 and w1 because I'm going to refer to these as weights and w is the first letter of the word weight. Um, and we can write this as w0, our intercept, plus a sum over j, I'm going to say what this is, of wj, xj, okay? Mm -hmm. And j here is going to denote the number of, of uh, covariates, okay? So we have, here we have x1 and x2, but in the future we have x1, x2, x3, x4, you know, a million SNPs, each SNP is an x, an xj, okay? So we use i for individuals, we use j for uh, dimensions, covariates, inputs, however you want to call it. And I'll, I'll use all these words just to confuse you. <laughs> so, um, but the principles are the same. So now we put things in a, in a vector, okay? So that's why vectors are, are useful. So we have W uh, vector and it's going to be an object that is W1, W2. We have W0 in this case and WP. So it's going to look something like this. And we're going to put x in a vector. And it's going to look like this, x1, x2, xp. And here I'm going to do a trick so that we don't have to um, bring the intercept term over and over. So I'm going to put a 1 here. Okay, so we can imagine that um, this thing here is multiplied by 1 for every data point. And that doesn't change our solutions or our mathematics. So we're going to do this just for simplicity and then we can write this thing. So y is going to be the dot product, I'm going to explain what this is, of w with x and this is the transpose, okay? And a dot product is basically, so the transpose of a matrix, if we take w transpose, then we just flip it. So this is going to be, uh, sorry, w w0, w1, w2, wp. So instead of vertical, it's now horizontal. That's the transpose. And um, the dot product here, so w transpose x, is basically an element-wise multiplication plus addition. So just to write an example with just two variables, uh, sorry, two dimensions, if we have w is equal to, sorry, w transpose, let's say w1 and w2, and x is x1, x2, then if we have w transpose x, this is basically x1, x2 times, sorry, w1, w2 times x1, x2, and this is basically 
w1 x1 plus w2 x2. Okay, and if we had p, then it would be w3 x3, uh, x3, w4 x4, and so on. Right? That's the definition of a dot product, which is what we're using. Everyone can see this? Yeah. Okay, so this is basically, this summation there is the same as what we have here, right? So everything is equivalent. Um, so now, similar to before, in two dimensions, the response yi is generated by this linear model, which we now represent with vectors, plus our Gaussian noise. And we can again minimize uh, the likelihood or the least squares in this uh, higher space. And this is basically going to lead to something that looks like this. So in two dimensions, it's a plane cuts through the data. And again, we minimize the differences, the how far away our data points are from this plane. Um, the slides are in the Google Drive, so we, you don't need to actually... Write. Good. Okay, and this is a formula that you might, some of you might see a lot. Um, I don't know, maybe not. But in, uh, in human genetics, it, it tends to be there. And this is the solution of this system. So before we had, you know, alpha and beta, maximum likelihood solutions. Now we need the maximum likelihood solutions of W. And this is given by something that is called a pseudo-inverse. So this is a data matrix, X. We basically have, each X is a vector, its data point, its individual now has many covariates. So we have a vector, okay? For individual one, one vector. For individual two, second vector. Third vector, and so on, for as many data points. So this is a matrix. And this is our matrix X. Okay, and we need to take the inverse of that and then um, you don't need to remember the solution, but at least you know where it comes from if you come across it in some paper or something like this, right? And if we have P covariates, then what do you think we need to do? We're going to fit a P-dimensional hyperplane, but unfortunately I can't. I can't uh, help you visualize this, <laughs> okay. So, um, but the solution is the same. So this matrix um, has, in, in the case of 2D, this matrix would have just two columns, right, and n data points. In the case of uh, a p-dimensional data set, then this matrix will have p columns. Okay. So um, now we're gonna see what we do if we have a uh, binary variable, or if we have a variable that is, is no longer continuous, right? So it could be that we want to classify um, cases and controls, which is the most common example in, in the data sets that we will be working with, but it could also be that we have more than two classes. So if we have just cases and controls, I'm going to call these classes. So we have the class of cases and the class of controls, um, but we might have um, more than more than two classes. And again, uh, in machine learning, we separate the two. We say, if we have a continuous thing, we have regression. If we have um, binary or categorical variables, then we have classification in the output, right? So it could be that we have, uh, I don't know, um, we want to classify colors. We want to say, this is red, this is blue, this is green. We have three classes. Doesn't make sense. I can't come up with very good examples just now of, of three class problems. Any of you can? What could be a good three class problem? Could you have like, um, the two frames stages or something? So like stage classification Mhm. Mhm. Genotypes if you wanted to predict if that's your output. But uh, yeah, it could be, uh, it could be. Um, but stages of disease is maybe a bit more complicated because one of the labels comes after the other, right? So if you have three, then you previously had two and you previously had one, if these are stages. Um, and in classification, each thing is separate. So in principle, in, when you have classes, you, you may want to 
to model this. You can, in fact, use it as separate classes. It's, okay, these are stage four, these are stage three, this is stage zero, how do we separate these three? Uh, but uh, it might make sense to actually try and model this because you might expect that what happens is stage zero to stage one, state, so from stage zero to stage one, you might have a little bit more when you go to stage two, depending on what is the input and the output, of course. Right. Um, but for now, we're going to just consider binary, so we have either case or control, just because it's easier. Um, and we're going to represent zero is a case and one is a control. It doesn't really matter, it's uh, the other way around is, is fine as well. And this we call classification, right? And now what we want to learn, what we want to predict or what we want to, uh, to find out, to infer, is what is the probability of an output belonging to class one or to class zero, right? So we no longer have height as our uh, output. We have, uh, I don't know, um, case control status. I suppose, is everyone happy with case control status? Yep, okay, good. So now our probabilistic model is going to be what is the probability of yi being equal to 1 given our inputs, this is a vector, and our parameters theta, right? right. So yi is basically a discrete variable now. Okay. So logistic regression, what does it do? It says, okay, probabilities, as you heard from Janine yesterday, have to be from zero to one. That's it, okay? But we, we have a nice way of modeling continuous data, which is, you know, this nice model um, uh, that y is alpha and beta x, okay? We have this nice model, we know it works, we can predict height or whatever, why don't we use this and see, try and, and, and um, imagine that this is a probability. Well, that doesn't work because this can give you any value. It can be two, it can be minus three, and this is not a probability anymore. So what we do is we use what is called a squashing function. So you, want, you have minus infinity to plus infinity, and you want to squash it to zero, one, right? Okay. And the most commonly used one, at least in machine learning, but I think also in statistics, is um, the sigmoid function, right? So we have this kind of function. So z, or our model, can give continuous values, right? We can go from minus infinity to plus infinity. But this function, you see that it goes from 0 to 1. And it stays there, right? It never goes beyond that. So that is a squashing function, and this is the definition. So the sigmoid of z, z is our input, our well, input to the function, is, is given by this. So this is an exponential function. function. And uh, yeah, that's what we have here. So now we can actually, in fact, um, if this z was given by this expression, this is continuous, but that's all right. We pass it through the squashing function, and we get a probability. And, um, okay, well, we're going to talk about this in the next slide. So now we have, again, a data set as before. We have yi, we have xi, and we have only one covariate, just to start with. And, uh, but now the difference is that y is either 0 or 1, right? So what we observe is either case or control. And what we say is that now the probability of observing a case, or, well, of observing one, given the input and the model parameters, is given by the sigmoid function of this linear model inside the sigmoid function, okay? And we write this out, so this is the same formula as this here. Now z is actually given by this expression, right? So we just write this out, and same as before, if we have a lot of inputs, we can switch to this vector notation and say that instead of this, now we have W transpose X and we just write this the same. So this, limit, this uh, dot product is going to give us just a single value, right? We do element-wise multiplication and then addition. So we have um, W1 X1 plus W2 X2 
and so on, right? This is going to be just a single value. So we can pass it through the sigmoid function and we can get our probabilities. And here I have plotted different, um, so sigmoid functions with different alphas and betas. So we can see what happens, right? So what happens is, first of all, let's see, so we are in this formula, we only have one input and it's x. And alpha, let's see when alpha is zero, right? So when alpha is zero, we are at blue curve. So we have this, this blue curve and beta here is two, okay? And I have another curve which is alpha is zero and beta is minus two. And you see that the direction has changed, okay? So let's think what would happen, okay? So we have alpha is zero and beta is two in the blue curve. So as x is, when x is, um, actually I have it, no. Okay, so when x is negative, what will this term, this, this whole thing is gonna be on this part of the function, okay, the sigmoid function. So basically the probability of y being equal to one is gonna be smaller than 0.5, which is here, yeah? So basically what we're gonna say is if the probability of y being equal to one is less than 0.5, if we wanted to actually classify that person, we can say that that person belongs to class zero, right? So we put a boundary, we say 0.5 is the boundary. This assumes that the classes are, are equally likely, right? Because if not, then we want to take a different boundary, but we're not gonna talk about this in this lecture. Um, and so if X is negative in this case, then we classify the, that person as a, as a zero. If X is positive, then we pass on this side and we classify them as one, right? Whereas if beta is negative, then it's the other way around, right? Makes sense. This is the negative X and we classify them as one. And this is the positive X and we classify them as zero because the probability is less than 0.5. I see some faces that are a bit uh, skeptical. Are you, are you questions? No? I'll explain this one more time, right? So this is X, our, oh, our uh, variable, our input can take on a value from minus infinity to plus infinity, right? But we pass it through this function. So let's look at just a single function, the blue one. Okay, that the blue one is basically, the blue function, let's call it sigmoid blue of x is zero plus two x. Okay, that's, that's the formula. Uh, sorry, sigmoid of that. Okay, what am I doing? Yeah, okay, yeah, I wrote it right, sorry guys. Sigmoid of x is gonna be given function of x is gonna be given by the sigmoid of zero plus two x, okay? So that's what we have, we have alpha and we have beta equals two in the blue line. And now we want to classify this according to this, the output of this function. Right? So the function goes from zero to one, and we're gonna say if something has a probability of above 0.5 of belonging to class one, then we're gonna classify them as class one. If they have a probability of less 0.5 of belonging to class one, then we're gonna classify them as class zero. Okay, so this is our boundary, this line here. And basically what happens with the blue line, this boundary is exactly when x becomes zero. So if our input is zero, then we have no idea which class this person should go to. Both classes have 0.5 probability. What if we have uh, more classes? If we have more classes... It would be new, new dimensions or You can have, uh, well, you can have different things, but one thing you can do is model one class against everything else. Mm -hmm. And then class 
let's say we have 1 to k, class k now is 1, and everything else is 0, and you learn one boundary for that, and then um, one boundary for each of these classes, but then you need to somehow decide where you're putting your elements, and there are all sorts of different methods of how to do this. Okay. So, as we said, when this um, input here is zero, then the two classes are equally likely, so we have the same probability of belonging to each class, and then if this is greater than zero, then class one is more likely, and if this is less than zero, then class zero is more likely. And basically, this thing here is called our boundary, this is a plane, uh, and uh, for p-dimensional input, we have a p minus one dimensional hyperplane. Don't, you don't need to care about this. Uh, but basically, if you, if you take these lines, maybe later um, today, when you look at these slides, try and think for each of these lines, so we have cyan, green, red, and blue, for each of these lines, what value does x need to be before I classify someone as one? Okay, so what is the boundary for each of these lines? So we saw that for, for the blue line, sorry, for the blue line, the boundary is at x equals zero. For the cyan line, again, the boundary is at x equals zero. But we can see what happens in the red and the green. Okay, so similar to before, we can write um, the likelihood of this probabilistic model. So we have the probability of our um, label being equal to one, or this person belonging to class one, given the inputs and the parameters is given by this sigmoid function. And um, we can write the data likelihood for this. So here is a bit more complicated expression. Um, but basically we're using the fact that this label, the true label is either gonna be zero or one, okay? So we can take what is the probability of this item being one to the power of one. So if the item is actually one, then this term is gonna be, uh, is gonna be there. So this is the probability of actually observing this data point. Uh, whereas if the label was zero, then we are in this case, this becomes zero, so all of this here becomes one and then this term becomes active, okay? And then we, uh, we, pit the, we put this into one minus yi so that it cancels out depending on whether y is actually zero or one, okay? So this is a trick to write the likelihood. So you can see another kind of likelihood writing, okay? So in, in many, many models, it just boils down to writing something like this and then we can optimize, okay? And similar to before, we can you know, take the log of that so that the product becomes a sum uh, and we can differentiate this with respect to our parameters and set to zero and find the maximum. But unfortunately in this case there is no x transpose x uh, analytical solution and we need to do more complicated stuff like uh, following the gradient in different dimensions and trying to actually find the maximum or the minimum in, in the space. Right, so in the future, I'm not sure how many of you, but we're going to look what happens when we go beyond linear regression, right? And Janine, in the previous lecture, you talked about um, what happens, like cases when data points are not linear, so we can have something like this, and obviously this line is not a very good fit of the data, it does not really describe what happens. And also we can have in classification, we can have red items being here and green items being here. And actually if we separate them this way, this is really not a, a, a good classification. You know, if we classified everyone under the line as green and everyone over the line as red, we would have a very bad accuracy in our predictions. Okay, so we're gonna look at, at how we get to model these data sets maybe in the future, depending on how fast things go. And this is a summary for you, so these are the important points. We saw linear regression in the least squares objective. We saw how this is equivalent to maximizing the likelihood of the data. 
right? And how important this is that any model or almost any model, if we can write down the likelihood, then it's, well, not simple, but, you know, we know what to do with it. But writing down the likelihood under a model, under certain assumptions, that's a, a tricky part. And, and we saw how to do this in the case of simple linear regression. And then we talked about this quashing function when we want to do classification and we want to get a probability. And what is the decision boundaries? And we saw that these are all linear models, at least so far. Um, and uh, here I have some chapters if you want to um, look at more uh, about this or you want a textbook kind of explanation of what things happen rather than just the slides. And um, I want to, again, acknowledge uh, my funding from Pharmatics and the BBSRC and the Human Genetics Unit at the University of Edinburgh. So no clapping, this is a lecture, but uh, mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> this, mm, I shouldn't tell you this, I don't know if I should put this there, but remember I had this uh, exercise for you to do home. If you want to go through this, do it. What happens, um, we can discuss if you're interested. I think I'll stop here because everyone seems tired. <laughs> okay, so you can, yeah, have, Okay, I'm, I'm very well in time, so you can have your lunch and, yep, cool.